Hello and welcome to the NPTEL MOOC course on the economics of health and education. In the final lesson of this course, I intend to uh, summarize and conclude the discussions that we have had so far. Uh, learners, one of the primary objectives of providing this course was to introduce a learner to the basics of economics of health and education, but with a view to providing a holistic understanding of how to approach the subject matter of uh, health and education in the context of research. This is a beginner's course on economics of health and education and as one goes deeper into the study of uh, the economics of these uh, issues, one would realize that there are many other empirical issues and sectors that can be covered as a part of this course. However, one of the major objectives of this course was to provide different aspects of how to approach the study of uh, health and education. So, therefore, in this uh, lesson, I would like to summarize our discussion and impress upon the learners as to how to uh, take up issues on education and health if one is interested to pursue uh, further studies and research in this area um, by uh, interconnecting the issues that we have discussed as a part of uh, this course. So, uh, this course uh, had uh, 10 modules and uh, this is across 12 weeks, there are 33 lessons in this course. And uh, let me begin with the first uh, module of this course. In the first module, we discussed about uh, health and education and its links to human development. There were two lessons uh, in uh, week one of the course. One is we discussed the links of health and education and how we uh, link it to achievements in human development. And in the second lesson of week one, we had uh, a discussion on health and education with the point of view of considering them as human capital or uh, human uh, right. So, with respect to role of uh, health and education in human development, uh, we uh, tried to look at uh, two basic points. One is of course, the role uh, as in uh, why health and education have been considered as important uh, development links. And uh, the second that we discussed is uh, how health and education outcomes are critical uh, links to human development. The basic uh, idea that we discussed as part of these two uh, is the first lesson of week one was if we understand uh, human development as enlargement of people's choices, we uh, discussed that we will instantly see the role of health and education in ensuring human development. In fact, one of the uh, landmark definitions provided by the United Nations Development Program in 1990 that people are the real wealth of a nation and the basic objective of development is to create an enabling environment for people to enjoy long, healthy and creative lives. And in the uh, succeeding uh, weeks of this course, we discussed uh, in details about some of the issues uh, and uh, how economists want to understand about uh, long and healthy life and creation of minimum capabilities and how the basic understanding of these things helps us to understand about larger issues of uh, demand for labor and how it impacts uh, labor market conditions as we move towards the end of the course. Now, there are three important points that I want to recall as far as our uh, week one lessons are concerned. Uh, one is of course, the idea that economic growth alone is not enough or incomes are not enough. The traditional focus on GDP per capita, which was the sole measure of development was seen as insufficient uh, increasingly. Uh, while income is a means to achieve better living conditions, it does not automatically translate into higher quality of life. Uh, so, economic wealth could coexist with widespread poverty, poor health and lack of education and therefore, there was a need for a more comprehensive measure of progress which is why we came up with the human development index. But what was interesting for us to see is that education and health are the two important parameters that were considered as uh, measuring progress uh, of human civilization or human society. Uh, health was chosen as an indicator because it represents the capability of individuals to live a long healthy life. If people are not healthy, their ability to participate in society, to engage in economic activities or even enjoy life is restricted. And uh, in terms of an outcome indicator, life expectancy at birth was used as a direct and powerful measure of human well-being. Similarly, education is also an important indicator of human development. Uh, because education is made uh, equivalent to empowerment 
and it is a fundamental factor in expanding people's choices and opportunities. It empowers individuals, enhances their capacity to improve their standard of living and enables them to make informed choices or informed decisions. So, education affects not just the income earning potential of uh, the country or people, but also the ability to engage in social, political and cultural life. So, it helps unlock human potential and therefore, literacy rates and school enrollment rates uh, as outcome indicators were used to capture the extent of human development. So, in trying to establish the link between education and health and human development, we tried to impress upon the fact that a systematic study of how education and health is accessed in the context of different countries uh, deserves special attention. So, that uh, sort of formed the premise based upon which uh, we uh, wanted to understand the socio-economic aspects of education and health and how that impacts progress in a country. In the second uh, lesson of that week when we tried to understand the human capital and human right aspects of uh, education and health, we uh, began our discussion about education as creation of minimum capabilities and also how education is looked at as an investment in the form of human capital or giving rise to human capital. Uh, we uh, emphasized upon uh, Amartya Sen's ideas about functioning, which uh, translates into the basic abilities, the abilities to read, calculate and process information, so as to live a normal life with dignity. And we discussed how education is intrinsically important uh, by itself because it gives rise to creation of minimum capabilities. We then uh, introduced the uh, one of the pioneering economists, Gary Becker, who's, uh, who uh, has conducted a lot of uh, research surrounding uh, education uh, and uh, the role of education in human capital. So, we introduced the ideas of Gary Becker as a part of this uh, uh, week and um, also how education is portrayed as investment in human capital. Between uh, the distinction uh, of uh, education and health as human capital investments and human right, we took the example of health and we uh, brought out some important distinctions between uh, what are the characteristics of uh, let us say health when it is viewed as an investment and the characteristics of health when it is viewed as a human right. And ultimately, we concluded that uh, both education and health are uh, human capital as well as human right. There is an importance, there is a significance of looking at both of these aspects of uh, uh, right and capital. So, in terms of health as a human capital, we highlighted uh, the following uh, key uh, factors. One is the economic foundation as to why health is looked at as human capital. The economic foundation uh, advances the view that health is an asset or investment that improves productivity, human productivity at the individual level, at the household level as well as at the level of the country or the economy as a whole. The focus as far as health as human capital is concerned is on the economic value of maintaining and improving health because healthier individuals are generally more productive, they live long lives and therefore they can contribute more to the productivity of a country. There are of course policy implications, investments in health analyzed for their return on investment and this can include spending on private care, education about health and interventions that reduce the incidence of chronic diseases. So, health investments as far as the country as a whole is concerned or investment decisions on health at the household level can have important implications on returns on investment on health in terms of household incomes or productivity at the country level. Similarly, we also highlighted the point about outcome uh, goals where the primary goal uh, with respect to health as an investment is to maximize economic productivity and efficiency and health initiatives are then valued based on their ability to enhance workforce productivity and reduce absenteeism and health care costs. With respect to health as a human right, we highlighted four important points. One is that it is important in the on the grounds of uh, ethics and morality. So, there are ethical and moral grounds which perpetuate the belief that every person inherently deserves health care as a matter of right to life. The focus here is on inherent dignity and worth of every individual. Policy implications are that governments and societies are then obligated to provide health care services guided by the principles of universality, equity and non-discrimination. There are outcome goals and the outcome goal is to achieve universal health coverage and equitable health outcomes for all. 
So, these are two uh, distinct yet related aspects of uh, health characteristics that we discussed that health is essentially an investment uh, which gives rise to human capital, but there are human rights aspects to it because health directly impacts your right to life and therefore, it is intrinsically important on ethical and moral grounds as well. Therefore, the focus is on inherent dignity and worth of every individual. A similar analysis applies to the access to uh, basic education as well, where basic education that gives rise to minimum creation, that gives rise to creation of minimum capabilities also is a human right in itself and at the same time when dealt with adequately in terms of investments at the household level or the economy level, it gives rise to education as human capital as well. Now, in week 2, we started the module on uh, microeconomic foundations of health and this module on microeconomic foundations of health continued from uh, week 2 up till week 4, where we included 9 lectures as a part of this module. In week 2, we took up 3 uh, important lectures. First, we discussed about the unique aspects of health economics and uh, there we focused on the health markets and what are the unique aspects of health markets. We also distinguished between the uh, economic characteristics of perfectly competitive market models and how healthcare markets are imperfect models and what are the distinctions between these two forms of market. And in the third lesson, we, uh, we postulated a basic demand for health model following uh, Grossman model of demand for health or healthcare. So, with respect to unique aspects of health, we identified four important characteristics. First was that this is a market which requires a lot of government involvement or government interventions. Uh, essentially, in the context of uh, perfectly competitive models, we have seen that they are uh, non-interfering models or they are competitive models where government interference is at the minimum or none at all. But in the context of healthcare markets, we uh, discussed that uh, there are a lot of interventions in terms of regulations, whether it is the health labor force market when it comes to creation of capabilities with regard to workforce who should join the health labor force or it is with regard to the pharmaceutical industry, with regard to medicine distributions, vaccinations, immunization and so on. We saw that it is a highly regulated market. Uh, regulations mostly in the form of government interventions and therefore that distinguishes it from the perfectly competitive models of neoclassical economics. We also saw that there is a dominant presence of uncertainty because illnesses are random events. We saw that there are uncertainty at all levels of healthcare ranging from the randomness of individuals illnesses to the understanding of how well medical treatments would work or not and on whom. So, because of the uncertainty surrounding the uh, interventions of care, it has an impact on uh, demand for health care and uh, therefore, we saw that uh, you know because of this uncertainty, it is not a fair competition as far as buyers of uh, health care is concerned and the sellers of health care is concerned. So, therefore, because of this uncertainty, we saw that there is a lot of asymmetry of knowledge on the demand side and the supply side. There are large differences in knowledge between doctors and other providers and the patients who are the consumers of healthcare. And then finally, we also saw that the health markets are subject to various externalities which are behavior by individuals that impose costs or create benefits for others. So, there are unintended consequences as far as other buyers and consumers are concerned in the healthcare market. So, there are uh, various kinds of externalities which makes the healthcare market a unique market. Uh, these are considered as a unique aspects of healthcare. And here we are comparing the imperfectly competitive healthcare markets with the perfectly competitive models. Uh, we uh, discussed that there are not many real world markets that completely satisfy all the aspects of uh, perfect competition or assumptions of perfect competition. And we discussed that the reasons why imperfect markets may still be favored is that they are believed to work better than an alternative with public regulation and public ownership. So, we can think of real world markets as ranging from almost perfect to almost imperfect and it is in this context that we discuss that the market for health and healthcare stands out as being almost completely imperfect because of these unique characteristics or aspects of healthcare. In week 2, lesson 3, we started our discussion surrounding demand for health or healthcare. 
So, in health economics, demand for health and demand for health care are two distinct ideas, but they are interconnected ideas. And it is important for us to understand and distinguish between these demands because it is crucial for designing effective health policies and interventions. So, what did we understand by demand for health and health care in this lesson? Demand for health basically refers to individuals desire to achieve and maintain good health. So, it is not a demand for a specific service or product, but an inherent desire or preference for being well or well-being and leading a life free from illnesses. So, in other words, demand for health at the individual level or the household level basically tells us about the health status of an individual or a family. So, it is an individual's desire to achieve and maintain good health. But in terms of demand for health care, we refer to demand for medical services or health care services, whether it is in the form of inpatient care services or outpatient care services or medicines or diagnostics or treatments and interventions. These are all factors that help maintain or restore health. And this can include everything from doctor visits and hospital stays to pharmaceuticals to surgeries, etc. So, to begin with, we made a distinction between demand for health status or demand for health care and accordingly then we can set up the demand function. We also saw that the relationship between the two demands, demand for health and health care is not very straightforward because people may demand health care as a means to improve or maintain their health, but an increase in the demand for health could lead to uh, increase in demand for health care services. But we also saw that not all demand for healthcare is directly linked to improving health outcomes. For example, there may be various kinds of medical interventions that uh, may not directly improve health, but it is demanded because of other considerations that has no bearing on the health of an individual. So, uh, while there is some sort of a direct relationship between demand for health and health care, uh, somebody who is, uh, who is experiencing some negative amount of well-being may want to increase uh, health care expenditure so as to improve his or her health, health status, but it may not necessarily always be a straightforward one. And therefore, in the context of uh, setting up the demand function or um, expressing the demand function, it is important for us to have clarity about whether we are talking about demand for health or we are talking about demand for health care services. In this lesson, we also uh, concluded by identifying three roles of health in the Grossman model. Uh, we looked at health as a consumption good, meaning that it contributes directly to the individual's utility function in each period. So, therefore, being healthy is valuable in and of itself in exactly the same way as education is valuable in and of itself because it creates minimum capabilities. So, health apart from being a consumption good was also considered as an input in the production process. It generates productive time which is useful for producing more H and C, H meaning uh, health goods and C meaning consumption goods. Health was also looked at as a form of capital, unlike consumption goods, health endures from period to period. So, if it can accumulate or depreciate over time, it can lead to improvements in health today and can lead to better health tomorrow or it can lead to negative health conditions also. So, we looked at three important roles, health as a consumption good, health as an input in the production function and health as a form of capital which gives rise to improved productivity over a period of time if there is appreciation of health condition. We continued on uh, the second module on microeconomic foundations of health into week 3 where we had three lessons. These lessons also we continued discussing demand for health. Uh, there were three lessons on demand for health. In the first uh, lesson, we discussed about if the demand for health also um, follows the similar demand curve as we see in the case of uh, um, uh, regular goods and services. So, we asked the question is demand for health downward sloping as we see in the case of product markets. In lesson 2, we discussed about some of the comparative statics surrounding demand for health. And in lesson 3, we discussed a few hypotheses with regard to uh, empirical uh, studies on demand for health with a focus on health disparities. Now, much of the policy debate about how best to organize the provision of health care we discussed was grounded on two questions. One was is the demand curve for health care downward sloping or in other words is demand for health also very price sensitive as we have seen in the case of commodity markets, in the case of other commodities that demand for a commodity is very price sensitive. 
and uh, because we have discussed that health is a human capital as well as a human right so then we wanted to understand being a unique kind of a good in an imperfect market does health also uh, have characteristics that make the demand for it downward sloping or is it sensitive to price the second issue that we wanted to deal with in this lesson was people who face different prices or have different willingness to pay do they get different amounts of care and do they end up with different health outcomes and we saw that the answers to both the questions is yes and therefore we dealt with the issue of health disparities and how uh, different socio economic factors contribute to how much people spend on health and how much people demand health two important conclusions that we uh, discussed as a part of this lesson was one yes consumers are price sensitive when it comes to medical care and people with different budget constraints depending upon uh, richer sections of the population or not so rich sections of the population uh, there are different life expectancies and different qualities of life that evaluate the trade off between medical goods and other goods differently so we did find that these two are important questions and they give to two different outcomes we also discussed that evidence showed that people take into account price when deciding how much medical care to seek even for very serious conditions so income becomes an important constraint in the context of uh, medical care decisions uh, so which uh, led us to the uh, conclusion that uh, healthcare demand curve is also indeed downward sloping so healthcare markets consumers are faced with downward sloping demand curves uh, however emergency care may be less sensitive to price depending upon the context we discussed that economic trade offs matter even in the world of health which makes economic analysis of healthcare relevant and we also discussed that downward sloping demand implies a fundamental trade off for design of any healthcare system and various empirical and experimental studies have shown that consumers are price sensitive for almost all types of healthcare now in discussing this lesson we also took up cases uh, based upon the uh, oregon and the rand health insurance study and we used examples of inpatient care outpatient care dentist visits and other elective uh, medical care and we saw how uh, demand for healthcare is responsive in each of these uh, cases but on the whole we concluded that demand for healthcare is also downward sloping as we experience in the case of other commodity markets now after discussing the demand function and the production function in the um, lesson on comparative statics we brought a few other economic concepts to uh, unify the grossman model and uh, we wanted to see uh, what are the different economic concepts that are used to explain the situation of maximization of uh, healthcare or maximization of utility derived out of healthcare so to unify the different concepts or components of the grossman model we um, discussed the production possibility frontier with respect to health we discussed marginal efficiency of capital and two constraints in unlike in the case of commodity markets we talk about only the income constraint in the case of medical care we also talked about a time constraint and then we saw how each of these elements can be put together in a cohesive manner in the case of the production possibility curve we saw that the grossman model also represents the trade off between health capital h and other goods z and it shows that the maximum combinations of health and other goods that can be produced given the available resources and technology we discuss the marginal efficiency of capital curve which shows the relationship between the level of health capital and the marginal benefits derived from investing in health and we saw that it typically slopes downward indicating diminishing returns to health investments we discuss time constraint uh, which uh, um, individuals have limited amount of time and they allocate between work leisure and health related activities and this constraint affects the amount of time available for both producing health and earning incomes uh, we discussed how apart from income constraint time constraint has to be brought into the utility maximizing model of uh, demand for healthcare income constraint also we discussed in the context of the budget limitation that individuals have and we also discussed that incomes can be spent on health investments or other goods and services so for unifying these components we considered the individuals optimization problem within the constraints of time and income 
and we discussed that individual aims to maximize their utility which depends on both their health capital and consumption of other goods. So, we first define the utility function as a function of h and z and the time constraint uh, was given as allocated between work, leisure and health related activities w, l and th and income was derived from work and is spent on uh, health investments and other goods. So, we have uh, W the wage rate multiplied by the amount of work and W here is the wage rate. Income is equal to health investments plus consumption of other goods, so IH plus uh, CZ. So, we have an income constraint given by wage rate as well as the expenditure that we are making on health goods and other goods. And then we set the health production function as a function of uh, time and health investments. The marginal efficiency of capital is given by the uh, is derived from the health production function and then we set the optimization problem and the individual's objective here is to maximize their utility subject to the time constraint T and the income constraint and then we solve for the optimization problem. So, the unified Grossman model basically gave us an idea about the trade-offs that we carry out between health and other goods constrained by time and income. And the individual's optimization problem involves maximizing utility derived from health capital and other goods subject to the time and income constraints and the production function of health. And this framework integrates the production possibility frontier, the marginal efficiency of capital, time constraint and income constraint into a comprehensive model for health investment decision. The objective here was to show that given all of these uh, concepts, it is possible to carry out an economic analysis of health utility maximization as an investment decision. As a part of uh, the uh, microeconomic foundations of uh, health, we also studied a few hypotheses which brought out the socioeconomic disparities in health and also which gives us some kind of a toolbox to be able to analyze uh, socioeconomic disparities in various uh, region and country contexts. We have discussed a few hypotheses that are some of the common investigations carried out in the field of socioeconomic studies on health. And each of these theories uh, outlined works within the logic of Grossman model, but each one explains the connection between health and socioeconomic status in its own ways. And so, given the country or community context, each hypothesis outlined different results that may have important policy implications. So, for example, we discussed the efficient producer hypothesis. Uh, we uh, discussed the thrifty phenotype hypothesis, direct income effect and allostatic load hypothesis which describe ways in which more wealth or better education lead to improved health. Productive time hypothesis reverses the causal argument and says that improved health leads to better socioeconomic status. So, we looked at the two-way relationship between improved health leading to better socioeconomic status or better economic uh, socioeconomic status also leading to improved health. So, we looked at the two-way relationships and we discussed these hypotheses. Similarly, we discussed a Fuchs hypothesis which argued that patients or time discounting determined both health and wealth. So, for example, the patients required to uh, invest on health conditions or education conditions can have important implications for productivity as a whole. And each of these areas we realize that are an active and contentious area of research and they are still growing and they are very large and can be used in the context of the uh, different countries or regions that we work within. When we advance the module, second module on microeconomic foundations of health um, uh, into week 4 and we had three lessons in week 4. In week 4, we discussed about the economics of uh, supply side of healthcare. We also discussed uh, the basic idea surrounding demand for health insurance and uh, the two important uh, issues of adverse selection and moral hazard. So, on the supply side of the healthcare market, uh, we basically looked at the providers of healthcare. We looked at physicians and we looked at uh, hospitals uh, who are the suppliers of healthcare. We also uh, distinguished between providers and suppliers. Uh, we referred to them as two different entities involved in delivering health related services and products. And we realized that often we use these terms interchangeably. Uh, uh, suppliers and providers as being on the supply side of uh, health care. 
Uh, with respect to the physician firm and its production function, we looked at the product of a physician firm as an array of diagnosis, referrals, treatments of patients with mixes of diseases and illnesses. We looked at physician firms involved at least one licensed physician. Uh, we looked at the nature of the physician firm and also the labor and non-labor requirements uh, with regard to uh, upkeep of the physician firm that includes clinical services as well as non-clinical services. Uh, with regard to hospitals, we saw that there are typically not-for-profit hospitals uh, who can and do earn profits, but because of their form of organization, they may not and cannot and do not distribute profits to shareholders. So, we distinguish between the nature of hospitals as uh, uh, suppliers of healthcare and other firms, uh, the way we consider firms in economics. In a typical for-profit organization, the residual claimant of profits are the shareholders, but in the case of not-for-profit organization, there is no shareholder and hence no legally uh, designated residual claimant. And in the absence of a residual claimant, we discussed that their profits must be distributed to somebody else. Uh, how and to whom they do this affects the product mix, the costs, the input mix and also the size of the hospital. As part of this lesson, we also discussed India's uh, three-tier system of healthcare delivery and we focused on primary healthcare services, secondary healthcare services and tertiary healthcare uh, services. Um, uh, we also discussed uh, demand for health insurance in week 4. Uh, we discussed about the income utility curve. Why is the income utility curve shaped as such because of declining marginal utility of income? We discussed the links between uncertainty and expected incomes and what do we mean when we say an individual is risk averse. Uh, we also discussed the distinction between utility from expected income and expected utility from uncertain income which actually forms the basis for individuals demanding health insurance and uh, consequently we discussed a basic health insurance contract, what is the difference between private health insurance versus social health insurance. And uh, we realize that in uh, there is a lot of information asymmetry as far as the insurance markets are concerned. And we came up with a definition of an actuarially fair insurance, which is a contract in which the premium paid by the insured is exactly equal to the expected value of the compensation the insurer will pay out for claims. So, uh, we uh, laid the foundation for a basic health insurance contract and, as, and why people demand insurance. So, that sort of rounded up our discussion on demand for health and health care. There are two important concepts within the health insurance market that we discussed. We discussed about adverse selection and moral uh, hazard. Adverse selection is a situation when there is asymmetric information between buyers and sellers and it leads to a situation where individuals with higher risks are more likely to purchase insurance while those with lower risks are less likely to do so. And moral hazard we saw is a situation where individuals change their behavior because they are insured leading to higher utilization of healthcare services and increased costs for the uh, insurer. So, in the first four weeks of uh, this course on economics of health and education, we began with uh, establishing the links of health and education with human development, but then we moved on to exclusively focus on some of the economics of uh, healthcare and how we uh, think in terms of demand and supply of healthcare. Uh, and uh, that sort of gave the, uh, gave the learners a foundation to be able to theorize or to be able to understand some of the uh, policy decisions that are taken in the context of healthcare economics. So, with that we ended the microeconomic uh, discussion surrounding uh, health and healthcare um, in the uh, first month of this course. In the second uh, month of this course, we focused on uh, microeconomic foundations of education. And in the, uh, the week 5, we began discussing about education and it had 3 lessons. So, we discussed about demand for education, what demand for education really means. We started with a general lecture on demand for education. Uh, we introduced the learners to what are the contemporary issues surrounding demand for education. We came up with a basic model of human capital investment. We introduced a few influential thinkers in this field. And also we discussed about production of education and returns to education based on global data. We uh, tried to understand what it means to be able to discuss about production of education and returns to education.
We started with a simple question about why does schooling not result in learning and we came up with a few uh, possible reasons based upon the general reading that I had shared. So, dropouts was one of the reasons, low attendance, many education systems we discussed are failing to ensure that the children who arrive at school every morning actually learn. Uh, we discussed the possibilities about schools uh, not just about learning, it is where children socialize, they provide safety and often food and they make it possible for parents to work. We tried to understand the interconnection of schooling system or education institutions and the labor market also. And we uh, discussed that we need the statistics to capture both quantity and quality aspects of education. As uh, part of this uh, uh, module, we looked at uh, human capital investments. We discussed about um, the three types of human capital investments, how workers undertake three major types of investments to be a part of the labor market. One was education and training, second was migration, internal or outside and third was search for new jobs. And we realized that all of these uh, come with an initial cost and is made in the hope that investments will pay off in the future. And uh, we also focused on knowledge and skills coming from education and training that give rise to a certain stock of productive human capital. And we looked at the job search and migration activities that increase value of human capital by increasing wages received for a given stock of uh, skills. In this module, we uh, discussed working uh, definition of an education production function and uh, we looked at what are the variables that become a function of uh, schooling of achievement or uh, skills learned uh, in uh, schools or uh, education institutions. Um, we discussed about the fact that expenditure in education does not explain well uh, cross country differences in learning outcomes and it is indicative of the intricate nature of the process through which such outcomes are produced. So, it is in this context that we discuss the production function as a conceptual framework to think about the determinants of learning outcomes. And this conceptualization highlighted that for any given level of expenditure, the output achieved will depend upon the input mix. So, consequently this uh, implied that in order to explain education outcomes, we must rely on information about specific inputs. So, for example, we looked at this production function where A is the skills learned and it is a function of schooling, uh, years of schooling small s, uh, the school and teacher characteristics Q which refers to the quality of schooling, capital C which is a, a vector of child characteristics, so the innate ability of the child, that intrinsic talent and uh, skills of the child, H as a vector of household characteristics and I as a vector of school inputs which is under the control of household such as children's daily attendance, effort in school, doing homework, purchase of school supplies and so on. So, we moved on from uh, module uh, 3 to module 4 where we discussed about externalities and market failure. We realized that uh, education and health are markets that have unique characteristics and unique aspects to them. So, we looked at uh, um, some of the important uh, ways to understand externalities and how they impact the functioning of education and uh, health markets. And we uh, sort of tried to place a handle on uh, how we want to argue or theorize about uh, some of these issues that are uh, implicit or intrinsic to the health and education markets. So, three lessons we discussed as part of week 6 and module uh, 4. Uh, one was on fiscal functions of budget policy and the concept of public good. We distinguished between public goods, private goods, merit goods and then we discussed market failures and corrections in this context. And then finally, uh, in week 6, uh, we uh, discussed the question of higher education. Is higher education uh, categorized as a public good, a quasi-public good or a merit good? In terms of budgetary functions, we focused on three important functions, the allocation function, distribution function and stabilization function. Allocation function being the provision for social goods or the process by which total resources uh, is divided between private and social goods and by which the mix of social goods is chosen. Uh, distribution function referring to the distribution of income and wealth uh, in consideration of fairness or justice and the stabilization function referring to the use of budget policy as a means of maintaining 
uh, the macroeconomic indicators for example, employment, price level stability, appropriate level of economic growth, balance of payments and so on and so forth. In this context, we discuss that social good uh, distribution or social good allocation encounters a few problems and it is in this context we introduce the concept of the public good as some form of a social good. We discussed the two important characteristics of public good as being non-exclusive and non-rival uh, and that many goods that are provided by the government we saw have public goods characteristics to them. Uh, education and health being basic education and basic healthcare services being some such goods which can be categorized as public goods. We uh, also discussed that uh, there are very rare instances of pure public goods, but there are goods which have very high publicness characteristics and the social benefit of a public good is a sum of individual benefits. So, these are a few microeconomic concepts surrounding how to uh, express public goods uh, is something that we discussed. We also discussed the Samuelson's rule as a part of uh, public good uh, discussion. We also discussed uh, market failures rising because of uh, the uh, public good characteristics. Uh, for example, we discussed that exclusion becomes difficult in the case of social goods because of the non-rival characteristic and efficient resource use would therefore require that uh, price equals marginal cost, but in this case since marginal cost is 0, so there should be a price on it or not. And then we discussed about even though marginal cost of admitting additional users is 0 in the context of public goods, the overall cost of providing a facility or uh, a process is important and it comes with the cost. Uh, so, which means that even if exclusion is not applicable or inappropriate, uh, but it cannot be performed through the usual market mode uh, because uh, there may not be too many payers for the good. So, it is in this context we discuss that for provisioning of such goods the budgetary process becomes important, it becomes a necessary process because consumers do not always express their preferences in the context of public good or social good and therefore government interventions in the form of political processes of budgetary provision becomes important. Uh, we also discussed about how non-excludability can lead to uh, government intervention and we justified that based upon these uh, important characteristics of public goods, public provisioning is required uh, until there can be techniques found to apply exclusion in the case of public goods. As part of this discussion, we uh, brought in the discussion on uh, the challenges that, uh, that are involved in classifying higher education in terms of a public good or a quasi public good. And we discussed many important factors, uh, but to recall uh, some of the important points, we discussed a few aspects with regard to why there are challenges to classifying higher education. For example, higher education produces multiple outputs like teaching and research both by public and private institutions and they also undergo transformation changing their character and nature. So, then education is an economic good has to be studied and understood from the perspective of economic theory, but also there are other social uh, prestige and values attached to higher education that does not make it strictly possible to be understood within an economic framework. So, there are both economic and non-economic frameworks that have to be applied to the study of higher education. Moving on in uh, module 5, we discussed about health and education inequalities In so in week 7 we had 3 lessons where we distinguished between these concepts of inequalities of outcomes and opportunities and then we related this uh, distinction of inequalities and outcomes and opportunities with equity in healthcare and education inequalities. So, in uh, the first lesson of this week, we discussed uh, Amartya Sen's ideas of equality where he spoke about equality of uh, opportunity and equality of outcomes. Uh, with regard to education, we focused on James Heckman's work on economics of inequality, particularly in the context of early childhood care and education. And then finally, we took a few examples with respect to inequality of earnings where we focused on intergenerational inequality earnings uh, was an economic uh, outcome indicator um, to be able to understand the intergenerational process of inequality. 
With respect to equity in healthcare, we studied about the distinction between vertical equity and horizontal equity. We discussed about catastrophic healthcare expenditure in brief. Uh, later on in the other class uh, uh, following uh, weeks, we discussed in detail about the calculation of catastrophic healthcare expenditure. We also discussed about equity in the distribution of healthcare in terms of healthcare systems. With respect to inequalities uh, in uh, education, we discussed about life outcomes, particularly with respect to earnings, well-being, inequality in education between groups. We discussed about horizontal education inequalities. We uh, also discussed about whether education leads to social mobility or reinforces group-based disadvantages and the inequalities of resources and opportunities available to children, young people and adults. In uh, uh, module 6, uh, we also discussed uh, policies. So, in uh, week 8, we discussed uh, three important uh, issues. One was India's health policy, uh, we, second was India's education policy, we looked at the evolution of health and education policies and finally, we ended this week with an overall uh, discussion on uh, universal health care, which is the current demand as far as health care um, system is concerned or access to health care is concerned and we discussed it within the context of right to health. With regard to health care policy, some of the uh, questions that we dealt with or addressed were should the system have universal coverage and if so, how should it be attained? How does or should the government financing take place? What should be the scope of benefits and cost sharing in a universal plan? How does or will controlling of expenditures take place? How are new technologies introduced in the health system? With regard to education policy, we discussed a lot of things, but we started with the question of understanding how is it funded, how is it provided and how is it regulated. With respect to universal health coverage and right to health, we uh, address the questions of uh, the concept of public health, what are the social determinants of health, we looked at the WHO model on social determinants of health. We also reflected on the social and political understanding of the term power, the connection of a certain type of power with human rights agenda. We uh, discussed in brief uh, the question uh, with regard to whether India has a right to health act and uh, why have not we been able to come up with a right to health act, what is universal health coverage and what are the progressive we have made so far, uh, what are India's initiatives towards UHC and then we contextualize the debate between privatization of healthcare sector in the wake of structural adjustment program and globalization and the increasing privateness of public health and what is its impact on outcomes and then we concluded our discussion with regard to right to health and UHC. In module 7, 8 and 9, we carried out a few lectures which were on lines of general lectures. So, we moved from specific discussions on uh, some aspects of economics of health and education, we moved on to slightly more general discussions that are more research oriented in nature. So, for example, in module 7, when discussing about status of health and education in India, we discussed about global disease burden study. We also discussed about two important reports in the context of education, the annual status of education report which addresses the problem of learning crisis in India and the public report on basic education. With regard to Indian databases, we focused on the sources of data with regard to morbidity and mortality which address the issues of health and on uh, education, we discussed the Indian official statistics on school education and higher education. And in module 9, we uh, pinpointed issues on health financing and education financing. In week 9, with regard to the global burden of diseases, we tried to understand what is this GBD study, who carries this out, what are the super regions, what are the different epidemiological patterns on e in each of these regions and what uh, impact it has with regard to policy. And we discussed this uh, module immediately after health policy discussions uh, with respect to India. So, therefore, uh, I would expect that the learners are able to connect these issues with each other um, and generate more ideas as to how we can carry out uh, research by connecting the uh, policy aspects with the empirical uh, findings. We also discussed about the key metrics that are used in GBD that is disability adjusted life years, DALIs. 
we took an example of diabetes and we understood how dailies are constructed and how do we interpret dailies and what is the policy relevance of dailies. We also discussed a few uh, graphs that shows uh, the top 10 diseases in the context of India and we uh, had some discussion uh, about uh, the implications that uh, uh, those kinds of disease burdens has as far as the progress of the country is concerned. In the same week, uh, we discussed, as I said, two important reports, Asar report and the probe reports. So, we discussed about the concept of learning society, what is learning crisis and how Asar has been addressing the learning crisis and how, what are the methods and findings of Asar and how we can take some of the findings from Asar and build on uh, various other work in the research in the context of India. With regard to probe, we wanted to understand some of the facts and myths that this uh, report had uh, discussed. It was a citizen's report on schooling and we realized that aspiration for uh, quality schooling uh, is very high among poorer parents as well. Parents place a lot of importance and emphasis on quality education and it is not just true of urban households or richer households, poorer parents and rural areas also have a demand for good quality education. In uh, week 10, we discussed specific databases referring to the National Sample Survey Organization and the National Family Health Survey, uh, particularly with respect to data on morbidity and mortality. As part of a discussion on this, we also brought in other data sources that have been discussed uh, and we looked at some of the availability of data issues with regard to these data sources. On education, we discussed two databases, the UDI state of database and the All India Survey of Higher Education data. In uh, week 11, we discussed about the health financing and education financing. So, with respect to health financing, we started with health system functions and uh, how financing is an important aspect of health system function. So, we did not just look at health financing in isolation, but uh, within the larger context of health system or the uh, health system building uh, blocks, we looked at health financing as one of the important block of the health systems building block. We looked at some of the methods of financing, we tried to understand catastrophic health expenditure in a little more detail in this uh, class and we looked at some of India's health financing uh, models and what are the key features of India's health financing model. With a similar uh, lens, we tried to understand education financing by asking the question who benefits from education and who pays and the role of public authorities in educational financing. We discussed the screening model of higher education versus human capital approach and their implications in education financing. We also distinguished between the Marxist versus human capital approach. We uh, made a beginning to understand the heterodox economics versus human capital approach and then we highlighted the SDG 4 on quality education and the UN model of financing education because financing is one of the important agendas as far as SDG 4 is concerned. And in the final week, the last two lessons, we have moved uh, from our discussion on education and health and we have looked at the labor market. We looked at the health workforce and we looked at the labor market with regard to the contemporary situation in the context of India. And one of the reasons for doing so was that uh, we uh, know that health and education as human capital investments have deep interconnections with the labor market. We talk of human capital because human capital contributes to uh, workforce or human capital transitions into workforce. So, we discuss some of the workforce issues as a logical advancement of progression of discussions from education and health. In the context of health workforce, we ask the question uh, why a study about health workforce should be separate from the general labor force. And we looked at the wage determination model of demand and supply, the stock flow model and the WHO framework of health labor market analysis and we did a situation assessment on global health workforce availability and shortages. With regard to the general labor market conditions, we took India as a case. We tried to understand the distinction between labor force and workforce. We took, took stock of the contemporary labor market situation as far as India is concerned. What is the recent debate on Indian unemployment estimates and how do we approach it? What do the overall trends tell us about the employment of the rural labor force in India? And then finally, our focus area was on female labor force participation in India. And we also looked at 
the higher education transitions to labor market, access to education and transitions, the major reasons as to why India's women are dropping out of labor force, uh, public spending on education and then we summarize the uh, key points. So, in uh, 12 weeks of this course, we began from specific issues of economics of health and education to more general issues surrounding health and education in the context of policy frameworks, analysis, uh, different kinds of hypothesis. We looked at various thinkers, we tried to give a heterodox thinking as to how we can approach issues of education and health and then finally, we culminated our discussion by focusing on the labor market which looked like a logical conclusion as we move from education and health to labor markets. Now, for this course, uh, I have received uh, immense help from my teaching assistants. I would like to end the course as well as the lesson by appreciating the efforts of the teaching assistants. Smita Choudhury is a PhD scholar in the economics group working with me on health financing transitions in India. Anmol Gupta is a PhD scholar in the development studies group working with me on low fee private schools in India and Ronit Hazarika is a PhD scholar in the development studies group who is working on early childhood care and education in India. I hope the learners have enjoyed this course and there have been a number of meaningful takeaways from this course and I would uh, also encourage the learners to uh, take up issues from these uh, different modules of this course and build their uh, research ideas surrounding uh, regional issues or issues of development in the context of India or the states that you belong to or in any other regional context that you may want to build your study on. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Thank you.